All right, welcome. First off, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Thank you, thank you, Jody, for opening your beautiful, beautiful home. My name is Gina Viola, and I am running for mayor of Los Angeles. <laughs> and just give you a brief uh, introduction about how I got here. I have been a solidarity partner of Black Lives Matter Los Angeles for the last several years and have had the incredible fortune to spend time with leaders of that organization, with leaders of Stop LAPD Spying Coalition, with leaders of Los Angeles Community Action Network. I had time with them to listen, to learn, to be curious about how I could tap in, how could I be effective, how could I amplify the voices of people who it seemed to me were not being heard in every room I went into. And then I started begging people to run for office <laughs> in those organizations um, because I saw 2022 coming on the horizon. I saw how many city council seats there were. I saw that there was a mayor seat, a city controller seat, a city attorney seat. I started to think, wow, we could take some of this power we could take some of this power back if we could just get a candidate running in each of those seats. And then the time came and the script got flipped back on me. And I thought to myself, I can't not do something I've been asking other people to do. And if you want me to run, I'm gonna run. And I'm not just gonna run, I'm gonna win. <laughs> and I'm gonna take all of these candidates with me. So. I'm going to give everybody else an opportunity to introduce themselves now. Are you okay with Yeah, yeah, okay. sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me, everybody. I'm Jimmy Biblars. I'm running in Council District 5. Yeah, maybe a couple residents. <laughs> Most of West LA. A little bit about my political backstory. I grew up in the Pico Robertson neighborhood. I like to say one block south of Synagogue Row in the heart of Jewish LA. And uh, my political awakening came in adolescence. When I was 12, my family was evicted from our half of a duplex apartment. An out-of-state landlord wanted to tear the two-unit duplex down and build a single-family McMansion on the corner and told us we had to leave. And in the aftermath, we were chased around the city by housing affordability issues. And both my parents struggled very, very seriously with substance use and luckily have both been in long-term recovery. But the combination of this early childhood confrontation with inequality and sort of gay coming of age in the heyday of Proposition 8, uh, but also the incredible social movement that that catalyzed were uh, an introduction to politics that said politics matters, it matters for my life, for the lives of people I care about, and I've been working in politics and research and activism ever since. I'm an academic by training, I teach at UCLA Law School, sorry, um, and uh, uh, I, uh, my academic background, my, I'm a sociologist, and my portfolio was all about the rise of income and wealth inequality, and in particular how it intersects with housing issues, obviously very close to my heart personally, but also academically. And when my partner and I moved back to LA a few years ago, we were painfully struck by the homeless and housing crisis, as we all are. It, it's something we all live with. And I saw a city that was failing to grapple with the core root causes of these issues, where you have had real wages remain completely flat for the past 60 years, and the cost of housing increased 11 times. And that gulf between housing costs and wages being responsible for so much of the economic precarity we see, the rise of poverty, the number of families on the brink of eviction or housing precarity, and ultimately, the tens of thousands that are pushed onto our streets uh, over the last years. And when I learned that the incumbent of over 10 years in Council District 5, West LA, which has long been a barrier to social progress on housing and transportation and so many of the other issues, despite being the geographic center of the city of Los Angeles, I crunched the numbers and knew there was an opportunity to do something big in an important part of town around so many of the issues that I care most deeply about, and I decided to run. So thank you all for having me. My campaign manager, Nick, is here. Thanks to him. He's amazing. Uh, and looking forward to our chat tonight. All right. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. <laughs> My name is Brian Sodega. I just want to first of all thank you know Gina. Thank you, Sister Gina, for inviting me to be in this panel. It's a pleasure to be here with you, with uh, with Jody. Thank you for hosting us, and it's a pleasure to be in community with all of y'all. Um, you know, folks like me aren't expected to be involved in political in politics. Um, you know, uh, I oftentimes say politics happened to me <laughs> because. 
uh, when I was, um, you know, I'm a proud somebody Nigerian immigrant. My parents came to this country uh, in search of, you know, a better life and to create a family um, with opportunities that they didn't get when they were at, back in Nigeria. So my mom, she became a nurse. And my dad was a taxi cab driver. Um, but at the age of between seven to eight years old, my father got detained by ICE and was forced to leave the country because the fees to fight his defense um, was just too much for my mom, who at the time was a student and was working you know, retail, and so it just you know, it was tough. Um, and so for most of my life, I grew up in a single parent household, relied on food stamps and public assistance and public transportation and all the things that we could find to get by. Um, but through the, the lessons that my mom exemplified of being resourceful in times of adversity, being resilient, and also being compassionate as a nurse for um, mainly for children with special disabilities. Um, I was able to become the first member of my family to graduate from college at UCLA. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Um, but what uh, ultimately pushed me to getting involved into politics was the Sun Rights Movement because as a young person, you know, I was aware that um, the life that we're growing up in is different than the generations before. But also, I come from a district, District 15, which includes Watts and goes all the way down to San Pedro. And it's a heavily industrialized, um, has the highest rate of oil uh, uh, activity in the city of Los Angeles, the third largest urban oil field in the country. And so, for most of my life, I thought it was normal to live next door to a warehouse. I lived next door to two warehouses and a factory that it's normal to have multiple members of your family and your friends and your colleagues who have asthma or cancer or some type of other health issue. But when I volunteered for my first Sunrise event, which was a Green New Deal town hall, I realized that actually these issues um, aren't a natural uh, occurrence, that actually these are decisions being made by those in power, you know, deciding that it's okay for these communities to live like this and not have any type of resources or opportunities. And so I decided to become an educator uh, for LUSD, for high schools. Um, and I ultimately decided to run for city council because after 2020, I was seeing <laughs> what was happening in my district. We were being represented by a guy who's been in office for 10 years. 10 years is a long time, right? And during that time, he one of, was one of the biggest, if not the biggest, opponent to any type of uh, air standard, um, any type of, you opposed having a setback for oil drilling, which is something that Texas has, but California doesn't have yet, right? So even behind Texas on that issue. Um, and also he was a huge advocate for the criminalization of homelessness. And um, you know, one thing led to another, I was frustrated, and so I turned my anger into action, just like I did with Sunrise. And although it's open seat now, the issues have still uh, remained the same. The stakes have never remained so high. A majority of my residents, my fellow residents, are renters. We, um, a quarter of our residents are experiencing poverty. And so there's a lot of issues um, that our district is going through that isn't being addressed by the city council, by the city government. And so I'm running to make our city work for working people, to reinvest you know, uh, monies from our over-bloated LEPD budget into community programs. Um, to pass a bold Green New Deal so that we can make our city livable and sustainable for all and also um, you know, enact you know, tenants, stronger tenants' rights and protections. So thank you again for having me. Looking forward to uh, the discussion. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I am not Albert Corrado, who is running for s CD13. I'm Cynthia Mesqua. I'm his campaign manager, and I'm going to be here representing him tonight. Unfortunately, he had a prior commitment. Um, so a little bit about Albert. He's born and raised here in Los Angeles, lifelong Angelino. So he knows what it's like to have to grow up in the city of LA, right? Having to work multiple jobs to make ends meet. Um, he's had a variety of jobs that I think can make him super qualified to represent the people of Los Angeles in city council. Um, those include he's worked as a barista, he's worked as a bartender, um, he's worked in jobs where he's actually talking to working class Angelinos. Um, Albert was brought into organizing and politics through it get like seeing viscerally how much this city lets LAPD do whatever they want um, to the point where they're allowed to murder his sister and nothing happened. 
And that's what brought Albert into this because that's not a city that he's willing to live in and not be active in. And so he's done a lot in organizing in the last few years. Uh, he's been helping with SELA and volunteering with homeless outreach and housed community members. Um, he's been with No Olympics, understanding just how much these big sporting events contribute to criminalization and just accelerate and increase those budgets. Um, at the core of everything that Albert does, I think, is this understanding of how much the LAPD and our approach to criminalization, our approach to militarization, is in the way of everything else that would make the city livable. The way that that takes up all our money and prevents us funding the important projects that we need, capping oil wells, all these things that are impacting Angelino's health and literally shortening lifespans. So if I had to summarize why Albert's in this fight, He's here because we all deserve to live, and we all li deserve to live full, dignified lives. I'm so excited to be here with y'all. Really stoked to hear from y'all. Hello, everyone. I'm Kenneth Mejia. He, him. Uh, thank you, Gina, for the invitation, and Jody for, for hosting us today. Um, I'm running for city controller. It's the uh, city's accountant and auditor. And, you know, about me, I was born and raised in Silmar, in the San Fernando Valley. Yeah. Yep, that's what's up. Yeah. So I grew up in Silmar, and, uh, you know, at a young age, my parents got divorced. I've been raised by my mom pretty much my whole life. And she took care of me and my siblings, and so she really instilled education and hard work and just being there for people, being compassionate, you know. And I think that really... Um, shows how I got involved with a lot of things, um, especially in organizing. I've been a member of the LA Tenants Union since 2016, where we fight for tenants and to make housing a human right. And also, <laughs> and also organizing uh, for our unhoused neighbors as well. Professionally, I've been a certified public accountant, um, and I've been doing this uh, accounting and auditing for 11 years. And I felt like this position as the city's independent watchdog can be very powerful. Um, nine out of 10 people don't know this position even exists, but it's a city-wide position. And you know we have the power to subpoena. We have the power to be independent of city council and the mayor to actually do our job and holding those in power accountable. And you know I decided with my knowledge in, in accounting and auditing and finance and just communicating with people in ways that is understandable to them and making that information accessible is something that I specialize in. So that's why I decided to run. And so, you know, our campaign's goals are to provide financial transparency, um, accountability, education, and then also provide resources for people so that they can use city data to, you know, to advocate for the resources and funding they need. So I'm glad to be here tonight. So thank you, everyone. Yeah, I'm just real excited to hear uh, what you're going to say for the rest of the evening. I saw out in the streets a couple years ago in the summer, the, ro the streets were roiling six weeks in a row with um, thousands and thousands of people demanding a major paradigm shift. Not demanding, you know, incremental change, reformism, right? or marginalism, but rather fundamental change, not only addressing police brutality, but also systemic racism, structural and systemic matters. And those marches in the streets translated into movement at the ballot box. So that very November, the voters in LA went to the ballot boxes, to the ballot box and cast their ballots and in comes George Gascon and out the traditional law and order, yeah. no holding police accountable DA. Yeah. Yeah. Defund the police, that's Measure J. 10%, yeah. all right, that, uh, those are the voters responding to what went on out in the street, right? The zeitgeist really changed. And I think it's still here, that zeitgeist, that spirit, you know, that fire. And this is, these are the folks I hear carrying that torch, you know, that fire. And so that's why I'm just excited to hear what you have to say. Let me get out of the way and just let you speak now. You're making the rubber meet the road and it's awesome. Um, so do we want to, you know, open it to questions now or, you know, how would you like to proceed? I'm going to read a campaign announcement.
announcement, and I apologize for reading it, but as you all know, I filed in the last hour of the last day. Um, so the campaign has been taking shape since that. 1120, it was due at noon. That was when I turned in my signatures, but when I filed to run, no, that's okay. It was February 12th, we had until noon. My husband actually called the file clerk and said, my wife wants to come in and run for mayor. And they said, what, no, you need an appointment. You can't do that. He said, well, she needs an appointment right now. She's coming in, she's on her way. So, so yes, Rick Caruso thought he was gonna be last to run. He thought he was gonna be last on that list, but we stole that from him, so. So I'd like to read, if you don't mind, um, it's really, it's our campaign. It's a campaign overview on where we are right now and what we're gonna be working towards. So, save it over, top of those sirens. Save it over we all have to live with those sirens, not for much longer, no. Um, Californians United for Shared Prosperity and Power Los Angeles. We are running a campaign of transparency and integrity. We seek to expose and eliminate a culture of political betrayal, politicians' history of betraying their voters with sorry excuses of lack of money and cries to wait our turn is over. The time for radical, rapid transformation of Los Angeles is now. You know, two years ago we were in the streets, we're still here. We are going to create a culture of safety by ensuring that everyone has access to basic needs housing, food, clean drinking water, clean air to breathe, complete health care, education and fair waged employment. Our campaign is going to kick off a complete renaissance in the city of Los Angeles, restoring the spirit of this city that has set itself apart from all others on earth. It's time to breathe life back into the city that has literally defined what progressive and artistic culture looks like for the entire world. We will show the world what shared prosperity and power looks like. When our city overwhelmingly passed HHH tax, we voted for shared prosperity then. When our county passed Measure R and Measure J, we voted for prosperity and power then. The time has come to implement these wants of the voters. To do that, we must elect new leaders, community leaders, organizers, who've been carrying the burden of doing the work, of the, uh, the work we elected the paid officials to do. This city needs people's government who is fully invested in supporting these organizations that have been doing the work the city has been long tasked to do. It is time to unify our efforts, no longer based on our shared trauma, but instead our future, a future of shared prosperity and power. So that's my answer to where we are after 2020 and being in the streets. Our campaign is gonna run in the affirmative. We're gonna talk about the new world we're building, not just the one we need to burn down to get there, to make happen. Because it isn't about that, it's about what comes next now. We've talked long enough about what the problems are. We all know what the problems are. We all know who hoards the resources. We all know it's about corruption. We all know this. So it's time for those of us sitting up here to do something about it. Thanks, y'all. Yeah. Let me just ask this question. I would go keep the mic going. What would what would be the thing you do on day one, the top you know priority item you know on day one that you want to walk in the office and do? Want to go in reverse order? <laughs> great, great question, uh, Jody. I think I think for for us for city controller, I know uh, you know Ron Galperin has put out lots of data transparency on his website and you know is is known for providing that well we want to build on that we want to be you know our since day starting day one we want to provide radical transparency and i think what many of people have seen in our campaign is that we are actually providing um details and and transparency on issues that are affecting us now, and uh, especially on issues that people care about. 
you know and so i think on day one we want to reform our our website so that people actually know how to use the city controller's website because the uh the data that's on there a lot of people don't know how to get there or how to access it and i think that's a huge problem and you know you can pride yourself on like ron prides himself on putting all this information up there but if no one knows how to use it or if the data there is incomplete or there's no description on a 200 million dollar payment then the data is useless and so i think from you know from a cpa background we want to make sure that everything that's put out there is perfectly understandable it's easily accessible and you know our campaign has been doing that with our billboards with our own resources with our own maps and you know just if last week we dropped the news that the city of LA spent half of our COVID-19 release funds on the police and those are the things that are like hard hitting issues that people care about and so you know I think for us as as a campaign and especially as an organizing campaign um, we want to make sure we're, we're caught up with the times and we put information out there timely and in a way that is is easy for people to to get and understand. I think on day one, our vision is really to go in and start doing the work of decriminalization. I think decriminalization is something, especially with what we continue to criminalize and we know the racism, all the history that it carries with it, right? I'm talking about drugs, right? We, I think the people of Los Angeles are ready to decriminalize drugs and I think that is low hanging fruit that we can go in day one and move past. And that will have a huge impact on our work and our bigger vision of moving us towards abolition. If we look at how police spend their time, right? They're enforcing drug laws. They're enforcing traffic laws. Those are things that we can ha build consensus quickly that we don't need them on that anymore. We don't need somebody with a gun giving you your tickets. We don't need uh, to criminalize drugs, especially when we understand how that criminalization is used to build this entire narrative, right? Around substance use, around, and. What's frustrating is that we seem to be okay with drug use when it's wealthy people using it, but it's a problem when it's in our public spaces, which is tied into the fact, like, who can afford to do drugs behind a closed door, right? This is something that we, the, the research has been written, we, we know how this works, we know the role of criminalization in getting people to be seem vilified, right? In trying to get the rest of us to not care about those individuals. Uh, so we can start with drugs, we can remove police from traffic laws and enforcing that, and we can also go ahead and decriminalize being unhoused, existing unhoused. That is something that we actively criminalize with 4118 and so many other ordinances that we have here in Los Angeles. And let's decriminalize sex work. Yes. You know, let's, let, yes, let's talk about who that targets. It targets black women, it targets black trans women, right? So these are low hanging fruits we can, and this is how the cops are spending their time. This is what they're doing with our money. This is a, these, these are the salaries that we're paying. So I think if we go in and start with the work of decriminalizing, which will be supported in the city, we can move quickly towards abolition and people in the blink of an eye. <laughs> all right, all right. So thank you for that question. Um, I think one of, the one of the things that we would do on day one is start doing the work about enacting Green New Deal uh, because the Green New Deal isn't just about um, you know, clean energy policies, but also it's about reimagining and recreating a city that is uh, sustainable, livable, and just for all. And so, for example, Watts residents right now, we have a lot of folks who are exposed to water contamination um, due to lead in their pipes, and so we need to do the work. And that's been an issue that's been ignored and neglected by our city government for years, and so we, want, we need to do the work about um, replacing these pipelines and, and making sure that all residents have access to clean water, regardless of where they live. Um, in Wilmington, um, that's where the third largest urban oil field is currently located. Um, so the city has started moving um, in terms of uh, moving forward in terms of phasing out of uh, fossil fuels, right? However, um, the fossil fuel industry is very, is deeply embedded into the community. You know, although folks are impacted by neighborhood oil drilling, oftentimes the main ways to enter the middle class in District 15 is by working uh, for the refinery. And so furthermore, um, the refinery is also very uh, strategic, right, in terms of uh, buying school supplies and funding the Boys and Girls Club and 
on Halloween, they paint their big tank as a jack-o'-lantern, Google, Google it. <laughs> <laughs> Passing out candy, and so they're very deeply embedded, and so we also are very cognizant of, you know, we don't want to, um, you know, hurt communities in this transition. We have a just transition by investing in our schools, financing uh, school, after school activities, programs. Um, also, you know, with all these acres that you, that, you know, we were talking about, we're returning a lot of these lands back to you know, nature. You know, building, you know, more parks that are walkable, uh, investing in urban farmland. Watts has the, um, the Mudtown uh, Farm, <laughs> which is the largest black-owned farm in Los Angeles. And I think um, that's also an example of how we can go about being more sustainable um, and also uh, ending food apartheid by having control over, you know, our, the food supply, not just by the end, you know, getting the food, but also owning the production and um, you know, to serve the interests of the community and not private investors. And so overall, it's about doing that work and at the same time creating thousands of good paying jobs because we have folks in my district, um, we have high unemployment rates, but also underemployment rates as well. And we have a lot of folks who are working multiple jobs like myself, you know, growing up um, ju and just barely getting by. So making sure that we're creating those good paying jobs, um, enacting local hiring practices and jobs guarantee programs regardless of you know, whether you have a bachelor's degree or not, uh, every, you know, resident who wants to get a job should be able to do so in a way that is dignified, supports their families, and also their communities as well. I'm going to make, I'm going to make a pitch for CD5, because CD5 is perhaps not a district that's often associated with having a large progressive base in the same way as some of the other districts. But I'm actually going to wager today that it is the most important race in the city because when you actually peel Council District 5 back and you look at the numbers, 71% of CD5 is made up of renters and half of those renters per the U.S. Census would be considered severely rent burden, paying 40% or more of their take home pay toward rent. 16% of folks in the new CD5 are Spanish first language, 16% AAPI, and the highest LGBTQ population of any city council district. But as importantly as the diversity in CD5, the questions of housing and gentrification run right through the corridors of Council District 5. CD5, despite being home to some of the largest job centers in California, UCLA, UCLA Medical Center, Cedar sinai Hospital, Century City, the Wilshire Corridor, Beverly Grove, three malls and eight museums, has seen no net housing production in the last 30 years, despite explosive population growth. So when we talk about gentrification in East LA and South LA, that's largely because you haven't seen any new housing built in Council District 5, which puts housing pressure on other communities. CD5 has long been a place where politics has been predicated on keeping as many people out as possible by not allowing new housing construction and not investing in transit, making the opportunities that exist in CD5 hermetically sealed to folks who don't have the opportunities to live there. So my orientation to this race is saying this is unsustainable for a thriving and inclusive economy. When you've sealed off the largest job centers, people deserve to live relatively close to where they work. That's from a climate justice perspective and from a social justice justice perspective. And it is no longer tenable for CD5 to function like that. So on day one, I'm working to make CD5 able to build the kind of housing that real people can afford near and adjacent to the opportunities that are so plentiful in Council District 5. We can no longer keep these neighborhoods off limits to folks from throughout the city. The state's coming to take over housing in Los Angeles if we don't act quickly. From our policy projections, we can work to build 181,000 units of new housing in Council District 5. That could be a game changer for giving more families the opportunity to have the schools and educational and health resources that exist in Council District 5. It takes gentrification pressure off other neighborhoods, and it's an incredible integration force for the city of LA. That's my first priority. Wow. Bravo. So day one, I will be adopting the people's budget and putting that forth. And I will start by having a participatory budget session in each of the 15 council districts. First thing, first thing. It is long since time that we respond to what the people of Los Angeles want. 
The People's Budget LA has surveyed thousands and thousands of Angelinos about what they want, what, to, what they want to see their dollars going to, and I can tell you that policing was about 4% of that budget. And that is what we need to work towards. We need to work towards everybody in this city having a voice in how the dollars get spent. Everybody gaining their power back over where their wealth goes. Because make no mistake about it, it is the stolen wealth of labor that got us to where we are. So it is time to change that and we're gonna do that together. And that's why I wanna see a city council that looks like this because I know that on day one, these folks will work with me to make those participatory budgeting sessions happen and in a meaningful way. Not in a one hour presentation on Zoom, but in a park with lots and lots of people and childcare and lots of flip charts and different work groups and all kinds of things that make them tenable, accessible. You know, we wanna meet people where they are in this city. This city is wildly different from one corner to another and it's time for us to recognize that and meet people where they are and give people access to the power, give people access to their money. So that's my day one. I know you thought I was gonna say I'm gonna fire Steve Sober off, but that's day two. That's day two, that's day two. Let me ask a, a question that combines um, both housing and criminal uh, justice or criminal law, if you don't believe it's much about criminal justice itself, um, cracking down on the down and out. We tried it in LA in 2006 with the Safer Cities Initiative. We made Skid Row the most heavily policed area in the nation, urban, any other, in the nation. And we decided we were gonna practice therapeutic policing by putting, going down, arresting, citing, and saying the way you can address this arrest, these cuffs, this cage, is by going to one of these, 12, to, to one of these mega shelters and getting on essentially a 12-step program. Because the problem of homelessness, of course, is your inner irresponsibility, your inner deficiencies, your inner brokenness. It's not a problem of inadequate housing, inadequate jobs, inadequate health care, mental health care. No, it is really about your inner personal irresponsibility. And so what we have to do is get you in one of these 12-step programs that these uh, mega shelters are, are pushing. And, um, and if you don't show up on the schedule, and in appointed times, then you're in trouble. You know, you get into a loop, and now you're, you know, it, it's kind of endless. And we squandered, and I'll have to defer to the, to, to the, you know, the, the folks who know the numbers. Um, we squandered, I suspect, hundreds of millions of dollars because we're not just talking 2006, seven, eight, nine, ten. Did the, did the, was the homelessness problem improve? Was the houselessness problem? They did improve since 2006. Well, when we were spending all that money, so I'm, a, I'm having a hard time understanding how, you know, in the name of therapeutic policing, you know, the velvet fist and the iron glove. You know, you know, kind of um, how, why we are now going back to that way of approaching the problem, you know, um, and what are, uh, what can keep us from going back to that failed approach that you've been thinking about, because that does seem to be what I'm hearing. You know, I'm hearing that. I'm even hearing people say things like, you know, houseless people want to do it. Some do, it's, it's, it's a lifestyle choice. You hear bizarre things, you know, kind of coming out of the mouths of politicians who know better, right? But uh, what, what, what would be your, your, your response to the addressing the houseless issue without the intervention of punitive, you know, state actors like police? Well, the first thing we need to do is create a paid advisory council of unhoused people to talk about what we need to do. That's the very first thing we need to do. Criminalizing poverty is done, it's over. We've been doing it for 100 years. Kelly Lytle Hernandez's book, City of Inmates, should be required reading for anybody running to govern this city because that is what we've been doing for 100 plus years now is using these penal approaches to try and deal with poverty. We we're not dealing with poverty at all. 
In fact, what we're doing is we're feeding an overbloated prison industrial complex is what we're doing. And what I've seen of late since the uprising, the people's uprising after George Floyd, we've seen decriminalization of things with, with George Gascon, with uh, organizations like Justice LA decarcerating things. The jails are starting to get emptied. The prisons are starting to get emptied. That system knows it and it needs new bodies, and they've turned their focus to the houseless to fill this prison industrial complex beast. We cannot let this happen. We cannot let this happen on our watch, regardless of who gets elected. Even if I don't win, even though I will, even if I don't win, we need to make sure, we need to make sure that does not happen, because make no mistake about it, that is their plan. 4118 is to send folks on our streets to jail, to fill the jails, so that they then will go to prison to keep that prison industrial complex going. It's time to finish that, once and for all. Yeah, 4118 is just so emblematic of the city's consistent failed approach. It cannot work, it has not worked, it will never work. And what was it you said, Gina, that you like your campaign to be an affirmative one rather than a negative one? I, lo I love that language because I think it behooves progressives to be on offense about safety and security. And I think so often we're on defense or diverting the question, right? Um, because we don't want questions of safety to crowd out discussions about police violence or police brutality for good reason. But it is important that people feel safe. We all deserve to feel safe. And we know that the policies that we're talking about are actually better at keeping people safe. And that's the message to communicate. Not that homicides aren't a serious social problem, but that they stem from a variety of social forces and that we need to be broad in our thinking about the true health and educational resources that form the core of true public safety. So I often think in my district, um, Melrose, you know, a, a commercial shopping district that's often in the news for smash and grab robberies these days and whatnot. And I, I go to debate after debate and people ask me, what are you going to do about crime on Melrose? And for some portion of every, every debate that I'm at, there is a group that will only accept blanket policing as their that is the, 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 but I just know that polling shows it, and when we talk to people, even people who you think are hard and know that that's just not right, right? They know that that is just too simplistic of a solution, and they've experienced the 2006 safe issues and not seen. So even the most conservative people have lived through that and experienced no rid improvement in quality of life or public safety. So I often think uh, when I hear about the you know rising crime on Melrose. There was a project called Uplift Melrose. Has anyone heard of it? It was a local project that was uh, approved by both neighborhood councils, which is a feat over in West LA, and it would have taken away a lane of vehicular single occupancy vehicle traffic, put in a rapid bus lane, a protected bike lane, expanded the sidewalk, made the sidewalk more ADA friendly, a tree canopy, increased lighting. That is a public safety intervention, right? That makes a street more lively, more livable, more enjoyable. It helps with small businesses. It's more environmentally sustainable. It is a, in my city, CD5, it would also have been a housing intervention because that's a prime location to put two stories of housing, right? On a street like Melrose with tons of jobs and transit accessibility, right? So when people ask me about what are you going, I point to things like that, which will reduce the incidence of feelings of non-security without the very real risks that increased policing poses and the very limited intervention that we know police can make for that kind of criminal activity. So for my money, that's where we put our resources. Right, so, so thank you for that question as well. I think it's so important, especially um, you know, as a lot of our other mayoral candidates <laughs> um, have seemed to be very defensive and accepting, you know, the status quo of, you know, more policing, more policing to respond to every crisis. But we know that criminalization of homelessness, the criminalization of poverty is a failed experiment, is a failed project that has resulted in the harm of those most vulnerable. We know that black and brown folks and folks who are working class are disproportionately impacted by our criminal injustice system. And, um, you know, just to, you know, I, you know, provide a historical context. So Watts, 1965, had the, you know, had an uprising. 
It was one of the largest uprisings um, in the country f during that time. Um, other cities like Detroit and uh, Chicago, Chicago were also having, you know, protests. And, um, you know, President Johnson, uh, they uh, commissioned a report, the Kerner Commission, as to why are people, uh, you know, burning their cities, even though we passed the Civil Rights Act, we passed the Voting Rights Act, you know, what's going on? And what they studied, they found, and there was a commission that was, you know, at the NAACP and all types of legal experts, and they found that um, our institutions have failed, you know, pe you know people, you know, <laughs> people of color especially. And uh, one of the solutions, some of the solutions that they also brought up was to um, remove a lot of these functions that we, releg that we relegate, that, that we delegate to police into other departments, into other programs. And do you all know what happened to that report? They shelved it. <laughs> and so for 50 plus years, and the C California also did their own study as to why there was uprising in Watts, and they found similar conclusions that folks don't have jobs, folks don't have affordable housing. You know, this was also during the time when black folks were immigrating to the West from the South, trying to escape, um, you know, repression in the South and also looking for job opportunities. Yeah, even in Los Angeles, they're still dealing with police brutality and institutionalized racism. And so, um, and so this, so the solutions I feel aren't so brand new. You know, this, there's a precedence for this. Our country, our elected le leaders just haven't had the political will to do something about it because they are in the pockets of police associations. And so what, what we would do um, is uh, challenge the status quo of safety and you know, reimagine it by investing um, our funds. You know, I am a huge, you know, I back the people's budget and reinvest into a built environment, into investing in communities, um, into investing in permanent supportive housing, ending um, the 4118 and banishing uh, and prohibiting these encampment sweeps because, you know, displacing folks also doesn't help either, right? It's a waste of our resources and it further traumatizes those who need the most help. Um, and so that's what we would also do. Also invest in community programs. You know, when I go to, you know, Watts, you know, for example, um, this is an, an exaggeration, but almost every second or third block, you know, all I see is police officers, yeah. right? But when I go to the hills of San Pedro, and I love San Pedro, I love all of the districts, but, you know, what I see is parks and community centers and libraries and, um, you know, small businesses that are, you know, still, existing, um, and so I think that's what safety looks like uh, to me, and so um, that's what we will go about. Are you saying that the safer communities aren't the ones with most police? <laughs> 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 uh, Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, so I believe that all folks, you know, um, have a right to, uh, you know, safety in a way that um, empowers the community and not oppresses or continues to surveil them. So thank you for that question. Yeah, I agree with a lot that has been said. Um, I think it's important to center ourselves in that we treat housing as an opportunity for profit. That's, that's how we treat housing. That's how the policy around it, it's, it's another opportunity for profit. Uh, so we need to start clearly thinking about housing as a human right, and then maybe we'll start seeing the issue that we're seeing as a human rights issue, which it ultimately is. Uh, and We've talked about you know, the criminalization of poverty and we need to remember that's, that's a racial project, right? That uh, targets certain communities. Certain communities are overrepresented here in Los Angeles. We know the black community is overrepresented and in the individuals that are unhoused. And I don't think that's a coincidence that we're using criminalization against the unhoused community. It's, it's the same project happening again. Um, so I, I think also we can see just this Again, it comes with this how, how much carceral logics have been embedded into our psyche. Um, when we're talking about these temporary shelters and when we look at the rules that they have to live in them, the way people who are uh, forced to participate in them are treated, it's, it's carceral logics, right? So to address these issues, we really have to, again, not be willing to reduce individuals to a single identity, which is part of this criminalization narrative, right? Forget the human, see a criminal, right? Forget the human, just be afraid. 
that is a part of what's happening and I think that's why we're seeing the coverage that we're seeing and that motivates individuals to allow the police to be how we're addressing housing, right? So if we can understand that housing is something that we're all entitled to, that we all deserve to live somewhere that we can be safe, where we know we won't be moved, right? Where we don't have to go through the traumas of eviction, where we don't have to go through the traumas of simply like, having to commute really, really far and to just work and be able to make ends meet. All of that is gonna, we, we have to address that. And I also think that given how much we've all gone through grief, all the, all the anxiety that we've all lived through, we also very clearly need to start taking seriously mental health in this country. Um, not for the individuals that we see experiencing um, crises or different uh, episodes, but for all of us, right? Th this has been a lot of trauma that individuals have been forced to live in. And having police in our communities, having to interact with the police is another source of trauma, right? So we're if we want to change the lives and the quality of living that we have here, we're gonna have to address all of these hand in hand because they're all operating together. So, so I think from a city controller perspective, because we aren't policy makers, you know, I, I, we don't get to say who gets swept or who doesn't. Um, I think for what our campaign has tried to do is is not only put a spotlight on financial transparency around homelessness in the city, but also measuring the success of what the city has done or is trying to do to make see if it works. If if you know is homelessness decreasing? Is the you know is the the fact that we're spending fifty seven million dollars this year on sweeps is that working? You know is 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 forty one eighteen where it just designates an area basically illegal to be homeless, is that working? And I think from, from our perspective, that's what I try to do and our campaign tries to do to, to pinpoint that it's not, right? And I think, um, you know, as, as controller, you provide recommendations, you do audits, right? You see what's working and what's not working. And, and I think Gina, you know, said it perfectly we need people with who are unhoused to be on these boards to be on the decision making process on how to solve homelessness because what you're seeing is uh, people who who don't who haven't experienced it or are very who don't even live near where where unhoused people live and they're the ones making these decisions and basically just putting police everywhere as if they're the ones who can solve these issues uh, with people who are having mental health issues or, or, or people who are homeless and struggling. And I think, you know, that's, that's what's really important to have and what we need in the city of LA. And, you know, I, I feel like our city council members and our mayor, because um, they're the ones who are going to be pushing this, uh, we need progressives in there. And so, you know, I, I, as for me, you know, we always calculate how much we spend on sweeps. We're like, okay, there's there's 20 cops right here. There's 20 sanitation workers. They make on average $50 an hour. They're there for two hours. Like we could keep doing that, and we can keep showing how much money we're wasting and not really addressing the systemic issues or the root cause of why people are homeless. But at the end of the day, you know, it's 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 as only as much as what the people are gonna push and and our our future leaders here. And so, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to always be an ally and provide that data analysis and because you know I really feel that it's important you know as, as an organizer and many of our people on our team they organize around tenants and unhoused rights we just see that what the city of LA has been doing is not working you know when Mayor Garcetti took office in 2013 homelessness has increased 80 percent is that a good job no the rent's gone up the police budget has increased over close to a billion dollars and what do we have to show for it? Nothing. Poverty is increasing, you know. Um, crime, and then and then and then and they they say like the police budget, right? And they always try to point that. Well, if you increase the police budget, crime is going to decrease, and that's not true. <laughs> and I think that's it's really what our, our our campaign is all about. And so I think we always try to provide that analytical uh, viewpoint on on these performance measures and tie it into our tax dollars. And that's what we have to do with homelessness as well. Is see what has not been working and try to find new ways to, 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 to tackle the problems, so. I will give you the last uh, few words uh, just to say, going, uh, 
We're going to start with Kenneth this time. We all, you know, you've been down here this end and come up this way. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jody, Gina, for, for having me here. Thank you all for, for coming. This is way better than the other debate happening tonight, right? <laughs> so. You know, you know, I, I feel like this this next whatever, 80 days, right? I think it's going to come up soon. And in 50 days, ballots are going to be mailed out. I think this is going to be a, a turning point election. I, you know, there are so many good candidates running up here who can flip the scale on actually passing policies um, that can help make the city function better, right? Um, you know, when I when I talk to people, they're like, Kenneth, you have to you have to defund the police. Kenneth, you have to pass rent control. Kenneth, you have to. I'm like, I can't do any of that. <laughs> but what I can do is show you where your tax dollars are going, show you that it's not working, and be like, hey, maybe they, the police doesn't need 3.1 billion dollars, right? And 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 that's pretty much what our campaign has is is trying to do is is really come out with these like hard hitting facts that that people don't know about so that it can it can push them it could also aid policymakers too uh, to figure out what the budget should be because when I when these people tell me all these things about the budget I'm like you know these are the people here who are gonna impact the budget not me they, and and all I could do is just give them this information so they know that. I could tell them that, you know, did you know that 40% of cannabis sales go to the police? And they're like, what the hell? I didn't know that. And, and no one knew that. And it's, 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 it's and no, yeah, you just found that right now. And we just released that, we just released that, right, we just released that financial transparency fact today, but it's been around for like five years since it's been legalized. But, but, but these are the tools that, I and our campaign hope to bring, to bring this transparency, to bring this accountability and hoping that these future, you know, our, our next lawmakers here can actually then fix that. And so, you know, uh, I'm only as good as, 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 as our policymakers are, but I, could, I and as I mentioned earlier this morning, no matter who gets elected for mayor or city council, you know, as city controller, we will hold everyone accountable and we will call everyone out. And um, you know, I'm very honored to to be supported by <clears throat> so many of you all, and it's definitely very humbling. So let's win. So thank you. Thank you all for letting me sit in for Albert. Um, this has been such a treat for us and for me. Um, yeah, I I hear y'all that we all need to win, and I'm so excited for this conversation to be happening in City Hall. I'm so excited for this to be what's going in the official minutes, right? I'm so excited to have people in office who actually want the public participating and informed and making decisions, right? I. I see our work here, all of us together, Albert's campaign, is we really have to change the structure that we are having to operate in, right? How do we take all this decision-making power that a few people have concentrated with themselves and start giving it back to the people so that we cannot have these same problems happening just based on who's shuffling through elected office? Um, <laughs> there's so much to say, there's so many issues. Um, as a former public defender, I know I chose that career because I really see the criminalization as the nexus for so many other oppressive systems that we have happening. We didn't talk at all about incarcerated labor. We didn't talk at all about the foster care system. We didn't talk about all the roles that the government is currently playing and is doing a terrible job at, that is using at, through, with a punitive mindset, right? So there's, there's so much work to be done. I'm so excited for Albert to get elected and Honestly, I'm, I'm so glad to be here and be able to say, let's abolish the police. Let's <laughs> defund the police. That is, not, that is not a controversial statement. We can decriminalize. We can talk about it different ways. But it's time to boldly stand up to the police and say, no more. So thank you, Jody, for hosting us. Thank you, Gina, for inviting me here, it's been a pleasure, you know, being in community with all of y'all and all of, you know, these great folks up here on this panel. 
Um, you know, our campaign is about bringing the political process back to the people. I believe that folks who are closest to the struggle need to be closest to the solutions. Um, thank you. And, you know, I've, as a lifelong renter, you know, I know what it feels like to go through that struggle, to lose rent control as well. I've received, you know, two evictions during this pandemic while running for office, while working, because, you know, this city makes it really hard, you know, for working people to get by. I think it's uh, a moral failure of our city that the second richest, the second largest city in the country, both in size and economy, is the same city where you can find, you know, one bedroom apartment that's affordable, where you can work two jobs and still be able to, still barely make ends meet. That we have a city that is so deeply embedded in the fossil fuel industry economy that we have folks who are literally being sick and killed by, um, you know, our f health and future is being sacrificed for corporate profits. And so uh, that's why our campaign supports the Green New Deal. That's why we support participatory budgeting so that folks, you know, have the means and the resources to say where their taxpayer dollars are being spent. Because if we were to do that, we'll have a city council, a city budget that reflects the morals and the values of the people. And so, um, and so, yes, I'm also looking forward to bringing this to City Hall because this is what we need more of. We need more discussions and issues censoring people most impacted uh, and not those who are the most powerful and well-connected. So thank you all. Thank you much for having me, and it's so nice to meet all of you. I, I'd ask you to come and visit us in CD5. It's an uh, important race, and we are out on the doors every day. We'll be in Park La Brea on Saturday. And I like to think about it like this. Park La Brea, which is 5,000-plus renters, pivotal to Councilmember Rahman's victory. Add to that the renters in Palms, one in six voters in CD5, lives in the most housing-dense part of the district, Palms. Add to that the gay voters in Beverly Grove, where I live now, and that is more than enough voters for victory in West LA, okay? <laughs> that's what it takes. Those three neighborhoods have turned out as high enough, that's enough to get the 11,500 or whatever you need to make it out of the primary. So it is a winnable race, it is an open seat, and I'm very happy to know all of you. Do y'all see why I, endor I endorsed all of these candidates? And I would have endorsed you, Jimmy, had I known <laughs> you before, but um, long before I started running, I did endorse Kenneth, Albert, and Bryant because I saw them as the future. I truly see them as the future of our city, and I want to go with them and make, make the future a reality. And I want to thank Jody so much. Thanks, Stacy and crew, for showing up and recording this for us. Um, thank you, Johnny. Thank you, Logan. Thank you, Scott. Um, and thank you to Erica. Erica is a uh, people connector. She has a special power that she, she does that with. So uh, thank you, Iapo, for saying yes. Um, and Jess, will you stand up? Because this right here is why I'm running. OK? Jeremy in the back is also having a baby. That's why I'm running. We need to make this city, we need to make this city worthy of the babies that y'all are growing. It's time. So thank you, Jody. I'm going to let you have the last word. No, no, here, here. That's it. I can't, I'm not going to gild the lily. Thank you very much for, jo for, for joining us. Yes.